Welcome, everyone. I am uh, Ken Clairbout, K4ZW. Glad you could uh, join us for our presentation. Uh, before we get started, I um, just want to draw your attention to our uh, upcoming event, our next webinar on the uh, 26th of April for those of you in North America, 10 p.m. Eastern uh, Time. Uh, that's on the 27th at the 02. 100 uh, UTC, but the guy who uh, literally wrote the book on uh, terrain assessment, and that's Dean Straw and 6BV, so uh, Dean will be, be with us to uh, share uh, all the secrets that he's uh, learned in uh, two decades of uh, terrain assessment. So um, we will take questions for tonight's uh, presentation. Uh, you can shoot those uh, in at any time. Uh, if you do, please put your call sign at the end of the uh, question so we know uh, who we're talking to. And also, uh, we're going to do something uh, we've kind of gotten away from uh, on uh, recent presentations, but um, if you have a microphone connected to your PC and you'd like to speak uh, directly to Carl, um, we will go ahead and uh, try to take a few of those at the end of the presentation, and I will explain uh, how we will uh, do that um, at the end of the presentation. But uh, if you do have a microphone connected, uh, everyone is muted now, so I will have to unmute you. But again, we will uh, get into the details of uh, how we're going to do that uh, at the end of Carl's presentation. So with that, I would like to uh, welcome uh, Carl Lutzel Schwab, uh, Lutzel Schwab, K9 uh, Lima Alpha, certainly uh, no stranger to um, this uh, forum, and I'm uh, in the process of uh, passing the role over to Carl, and uh, he can uh, go presentation mode, and uh, once that comes up, um, okay, looks good to see you here, Carl, so the floor is yours. Uh, welcome uh, once again. Thanks for uh, being with us, and uh, go ahead. <coughs> hello, Ken, and hello to everybody. Uh, I'm Carl K9LA. If you don't know, it's pretty obvious because of the first slide, I guess. And what we're going to talk about tonight is uh, solar topics, not too much propagation, but uh, mostly just a whole bunch of solar topics because I think they're kind of interesting and I also have uh, references at the end uh, for those of you who are uh, interested in more of the details. So let's see if this thing works. Uh, no? Okay, hold on here. Click uh, click your mouse in the, uh, in the uh, PowerPoint oh, okay. window and looks like you've got to get that. Uh... There we go. Okay. Okay. And if and of course, I have to have a plug for the uh, WWROF webinars, and I think they're a great way to learn about uh, many other aspects of amateur radio. I enjoyed the uh, the three that have been given recently uh, by W3LPL, by K5ZD, and by K3LR on Sunday. And as Ken said, uh, N6BV has uh, his uh, webinar coming up on uh, train assessment. Very fascinating subject, and uh, hope you. Hope you tune in for that one. Uh, you'll probably learn quite a bit, and it's uh, uh, you know bringing some science into amateur radio. <clears throat> of course, don't forget to support the WWROF. Okay, here's a list of things we're going to cover. It's quite a few uh, topics uh, concerning solar issues. And as I said uh, earlier, there's going to be a little bit of propagation when it's uh, relevant. So. Again, we'll end with references for you to, uh, you know, go into more detail because it's quite obvious that in about an hour I can't really get too deep into any of these subjects. So let's get going. I thought I'd first uh, provide a update on cycle 24. This is the latest data. As you can see, uh, uh, the latest data we have is uh, the monthly data for March. And what that allows us to do is calculate a uh, smooth index. Uh, the blue vertical bars are the monthly means or monthly averages, which are calculated by just taking, uh, for example, all the daily num solar flux numbers in March of 2013, averaging them, and that's the, uh, the monthly mean. The latest smooth data is about six months behind. That's because it's heavily averaged, and it uh, uses data six months either side of September 2012. Uh, the smooth index is how we officially measure solar cycles, so uh, that's the thick uh, red line there. And what you can see is quite obvious is uh, in towards the end of 2011, we had some very high solar activity. The monthly means were, uh, you know, above 140 mostly, 
and uh, what that did is cause cycle 24 to have a uh, smooth solar flux peak in early 2012. So if nothing else happens with solar cycle 24, that could be the peak of cycle 24 in early 2012. We'll just have to see. I suspect, like many others do, that uh, we're in for uh, some more good solar activity, and we'll get into that later, why uh, uh, that could happen. Okay, butterfly diagrams. <clears throat> They're called butterfly diagrams because they look like butterfly wings. And what they are is just a plot of the latitude on the sun at which a sunspot region immerses, emerges versus the time. So you can see, for example, um, here's a good example, the biggest solar cycle in the recorded history. This is cycle 19. You can see that uh, uh, the, initial, the, uh, the first sunspots emerged at uh, relatively high solar latitudes, 30 north, 30 south, and then as, as the solar cycle progresses, the sunspots emerge at lower and lower latitudes and end up pretty near the uh, solar equator. So this is one way to determine which cycle a sunspot region is tied to by the latitude at which it emerges. Also, I put a note on here, uh, cycle 20, note the uh, asymmetry. Uh, cycle 20 started with a lot more northern sunspots than southern. The southern finally caught up. But that's kind of important, and it may portend some uh, uh, good news for cycle 24, even though it's been a uh, quite low one. Okay, magnetograms. What they are is just a false image of the sun showing the polarity of a sunspot region. Uh, of course, a sunspot region has magnetic fields going out and coming back in. They can be measured by a technique called Zeeman splitting. And if you Google Zeeman splitting, you can read all about how that's done. By convention on a magnetogram, uh, a black is a magnetic field uh, going into the sun. White is coming out. <coughs> uh, also, uh, one thing that happens is the magnetic fields are opposite from one cycle to the next. At solar maximum, the uh, uh, polar fields in the sun reverse. And also, the magnetic fields are opposite in the two hemispheres. So <clears throat> you can see down here in the lower left of the uh, picture of the sun, there was an old sunspot region. Remember, uh, the, early, the, the previous graph said that uh, solar cycles emerge near the equator at the end of a solar cycle. So that's uh, what's happening right here. This indeed is the first sunspot region of cycle 24. It came out at a high latitude, as we expected. Note that the polarity, uh, white, then to the right is black. For the old sunspot region, white to black. And why that happened is because uh, uh, the, uh, a new solar cycle, we would have expected black and then and then white to the right if it was in the southern hemisphere. But since it's in the northern hemisphere, that throws in another uh, negative. So they end up the same polarity. Uh, and uh, that can get kind of confusing if you're not aware of all that. But the bottom, bottom line is with butterfly diagrams and magnetograms, uh, it allows solar scientists to determine which cycle a sunspot region belongs, to which uh, cycle a sunspot region belongs. And I should point out that uh, probably most of you know it, that a solar cycle really is 22 years. And that's because the magnetic polarity of the sun changes uh, at solar maximum. And it comes back to the same spot, uh, not at the maximum of the next cycle, but the maximum of the next cycle. So solar cycles are really 22 years. And this uh, plot kind of shows that. Uh, of particular note is uh, a little thing I pointed to down here is that uh, the solar polar field for cycle 23 was quite weak compared to the previous solar cycles. And that kind of suggests that uh, solar cycle 24 would be a, uh, a small one. So we'll get into that a little bit later. And this is just the same picture as the previous graph a couple slides earlier. 
it shows the monthly means for the sunspots and the smooth sunspot number. So this is all data in terms of the sunspot number, not 10.7 centimeter solar flux. And the data exhibits the same trends as the 10.7 centimeter solar flux data. But uh, with sunspots, we can tell if they came from an old cycle or the new cycle. And you can see what happened. Uh, the red vertical bars are the monthly means for sunspots from cycle 23. And the blue vertical bars are uh, the monthly means from cycle 24. If you look really, really hard in the 2008-2009 area, you'll see that uh, there were uh, both red and blue, which says that solar cycles do overlap. And uh, there's a period, it happened to be 16 months for this solar minimum, that uh, uh, cycle 23 spots were concurrent with cycle 24 spots. But again, uh, Unless, unless the sun does something uh, very active, uh, this could be the peak of solar cycle 24 right there in, uh, in early 2012. Hopefully, uh, like I said, cycle 24 might give us a little bit more activity, and uh, we're getting to that here. Now, old sunspot data. You know, we have uh, pretty good historic records uh, back to the well, mid 1700s, but unfortunately, sunspots are a, a subjective measurement. Uh, her, human interpretation is involved, and there's some of the uh, official observers throughout the years, and of course, the capability of the telescope and cloud cover also uh, determine uh, how good you can see sunspots. Uh, the equation there is Wolf's equation. He's the one that kind of brought order to all the sunspot data. And it simply uh, <clears throat> measures uh, the groups of sunspots and the individual sunspots and applies that little equation to, to come up with the international sunspot number, R sub Z. Uh, K is a variable to bring different observers in line. Uh, also, that includes you know capabilities of the telescope, et cetera. Uh, back in the mid-90s, two gentlemen, uh, Hoyt and Shatton, asked a very simple question. How good is the old data? And uh, they realized that counting individual sunspots was likely the biggest challenge because uh, it depends on your telescope and uh, uh, some other factors. So they devised a, a group sunspot number, R sub G. And what it does is uh, just counts the groups. And the factor 12 takes into account uh, the, uh, generally the uh, uh, number of uh, individual spots versus the number of groups. So you would expect that if you divided RG by RZ, you should get 1 if there was uh, a, a perfect correlation. So that's what they did. And here's what it looks like. Again, this is RG divided by RZ, and it's with the data as we have it. Now, you can see that uh, there's lots of scatter early on in the records, and there's not really much we can do about that. Uh, but you can kind of generally picture that RG over Z was a little bit less than 1. One's over here, a little bit less than 1. And then you, we see two discontinuities around uh, 1780. And also, uh, 19, uh, just before 1950, there's, there's a jump right here. Now, um, <clears throat> again, this is, this is the existing data. And if you look at it, what it hints at is that we've lived through the highest solar activity in our recorded history. Uh, I think four of the highest five solar cycles occurred during our lifetimes. And I always thought that that may have tied us to climate change, but well, well, we'll look at that here in the next slide, in fact, uh, well, the one after that. Uh, this data is under review. There have been some uh, several ongoing workshops sponsored by several people. Uh, you can read what they are. And their ultimate goal is to review and agree on the true sunspot number. And right now, this is targeted to happen at a fall 2013 workshop in Europe. Now here's the data that uh, is believed to be more correct 
than the earlier data that I showed. Again, this is RG over RZ corrected. And as you can see, uh, it's, it's pretty much about the one, uh, the one uh, about one or so. So uh, the, the solar scientists who uh, derived all this believe that this is really the true sunspot number. It takes out biases by individuals, uh, takes out uh, uh, counting issues, etc. So now when we look at uh, the corrected number, we'll see that uh, really we haven't lived through the ma uh, the biggest solar uh, biggest or the highest solar activity in uh, in our recorded history. Uh, so that's an important implication, and it kind of dashed my thought that uh, perhaps the sun had a lot to do with solar with uh, global warming. I still think it has more than we think, but uh, it, it's not as obvious as uh, I kind of thought early on. Uh, it's an interesting thing to look at, and we'll see what happens with that data if it really does get adjusted. Uh, there are a lot of scientists have to agree on that, so we'll, we'll just have to wait and see what happens in the fall. Now, if you look at some of the earlier data, uh, it kind of brings up a question, did we miss an early cycle? This is solar cycle 24. You can see it started in about 1784 and went to about 1798, which is 14 years. And that's the, the longest cycle that we have in recorded history. And you've got to ask the question, well, how could we have missed a cycle? The data looks very good, doesn't it? There's no uh, uh, discontinuities or anything in it. Well, the problem is uh, there are gaps in some in, in in the old data, and what this plot shows is uh, how complete the data was during a month. Now you can see in uh, our later uh, years uh, that uh, all the dots are black, and what that says is we have complete months of data. But go back to cycle four, you can see. In 1790 or so, it's all red, which means uh, for that period, uh, we were missing more than 20 days of data. So what that says is uh, much of the cycle four data was assumed. And we put it together, and that last plot shows what we thought happened. But you've got to ask the question, what really happened? Well, remember the butterfly diagrams? Um, what uh, uh, the, the gentleman who was looking at this did is, is uh, found more uh, sketches of uh, the sun back in the uh, you know, late 1700s. And what it shows is that uh, you know, when cycle four started, uh, it shows that there were uh, sunspots at the higher solar latitudes, and as cycle 24 progressed, cycle four progressed, uh, the sunspots emerged at lower latitudes. Uh, right here is where we think cycle five started, but there's this data right in here that around 1796 that says there may have been some high latitude spots that showed up, which suggests that maybe there was a small cycle. Uh, well, cycle four really was uh, uh, not just one cycle, but uh, two cycles. And another way to look at that is look at auroral activity. Uh, we know that auroral activity peaks around solar maximum. So here's where cycle four started. We expect to see an increase in solar activity, and sure enough it did, then it started decreasing. But again, in 1796, it appears that there were some uh, uh, higher auroral activity prior to cycle five starting and having its high auroral activity. So what we conclude is we may have missed an early cycle. It was a small one prior to the Dalton minimum, and that's uh, 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 the, the uh, three sunspot cycles that were quite low uh, in the, uh, in the 1800s, early 1800s. I'm not aware of any discussion to further review this, and of course, it would be difficult to, you know, renumber renumber the cycles after four. Uh, so, if anything's going to be done, and I'm not sure anything's going to be done, it'd probably be best to call it cycle four A. 
uh, perhaps uh, there will be some uh, uh, further discussion. I don't see it in the uh, with the workshop that I workshops that I uh, mentioned earlier. They don't seem to be discussing this. It seems like they should be, but they're not. Now, talking about grand solar minimums, uh, we don't have any reliable sunspot data from long, long ago. You know, basically about 1750, that's when our good records start. And like we've seen, some of those records are a bit uh, uh, in question. But there are proxies for solar activity, and it's uh, carbon-14 and tree rings and beryllium-10 and ice cores. And what it does is gives us a broad view of uh, solar activity. If we uh, you know, look at the tree rings and also uh, you know drill down and get an ice core sample, and this is what we think uh, the sun has been doing for uh, you know about 1,200 years previous to 2000. Uh, there have been some uh, uh, grand minimums. That's when the carbon 14 is uh, high in the tree rings. Uh, the, the, one, the minimum that probably gets the most press is the Maunder minimum. It's the highest, it appears to be the highest in our uh, history that we can uh, put together. Uh, I mentioned that cycle four was right before the Dalton minimum, and that's, that's uh, what this is. The XXX is that little minimum we had right before uh, cycle 19. Uh, there were several sunspot cycles that were kind of small. I, I'm not aware of any name assigned to it. Uh, it could be there is one. And prior to the monitor minimum, there appears to be uh, other uh, periods where the sun's activity was quite low. Spore, Wolf, Oort, those are the guys who uh, kind of uh, you know, uh, realized that, hey, something was going on with the sun there. This data suggests that uh, we'll likely go through another grand minimum sometime. Uh, the questions are when and what magnitude. And uh, I don't think we uh, uh, can even take a guess at what's going to happen. Uh, we just have to wait and see. Speaking of solar minimums, <clears throat> this plot uh, shows the duration of solar minimums for all, uh, uh, all the minimums between all our recorded uh, solar cycles. And my definition of uh, solar min is when the smooth sunspot number is less than 20. So, uh, for example, uh, solar min between cycle one and two was about oh, about 18 months or so. And the next two solar mins were equivalent. Then we had some uh, long durations between solar mins, and we had some more short ones, some long ones, some short ones. And this is the solar min between 23 and 24. It was 56 months by my criteria of a smooth sunspot number less than 20. And of course, uh, it's kind of obvious that uh, the data is cyclic in nature. Now let's look at the maximum of uh, all of our solar cycles. The uh, solar cycle number is down here. This is the maximum smooth sunspot number. Of course, cycle 19 stands out as the highest one in our recorded history. But you can see that this data is also cyclic in nature. Uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4 were kind of high. Again, this is the Dalton minimum, 5, 6, and 7. 8, 9, 10, 11 were kind of high. Then we went into a low solar cycle period before uh, most of us, right before we, most of us were born. And this is, uh, you know, we've lived through pretty high solar activity. This is uncorrected data, so it kind of suggests that we've lived through the highest period, like I mentioned before, but I'm not sure that really happened. Now, just based on this uh, cyclic nature of the maximum, you know, high, low, high, low, high, uh oh, low, kind of suggests we're headed for some low solar cycles. In fact, if we line up that uh, uh, the maximum and also the duration of the pre previous minimum. Uh, I tried to line up these graphs so that the uh, horizontal axis are, is about the same. You'll see that uh, when the uh, a low door, low, uh, sm uh, a short duration solar min resulted in high solar cycles, 
long duration solar MINs resulted in low solar cycles, so they're they're kind of out of phase. And in fact, if we do a uh, a scatter diagram correlating those two parameters, the months at solar min and also the maximum of the next sunspot cycle, this is what we get. The red trend line suggests what's uh, going to happen. And based on the fact that the minimum between 23 and 24 was 56 months, it kind of suggests that, well, cycle 24 is going to be something around 80 in terms of the smooth sunspot number which translates to 10.7 uh, uh, centimeter solar flux of about 130. Now the correlation is not perfect. If it was perfect, R squared would be 1, and all the data points would fall right on the trend line. So uh, th there's still room for cycle 24 to be, you know, maybe uh, uh, 50 to, uh, and the low 100s, 120 or something. Again, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. So that's uh, our prediction, just based on some simple, uh, looking at some of the simple data of our uh, uh, sunspot history. Uh, here's some, uh, uh, one of the most notable, uh, well, there, there's two uh, predictions that probably get lots of press. One is from ISES, which is the International Space Environment Service. And you can find that at the uh, URL at the bottom of the page. Uh, they have not changed their prediction since mid-2009. They're sticking with, with what they said. Uh, prior to mid-2009, they carried two predictions, one for a high solar cycle, one for a low. Uh, if you follow this, you probably remember that. And that was because solar scientists just couldn't agree. Some said it's going to be a biggie. Some said, nope, it's going to be a little one. So for a while, they carried both predictions. And when the solar minimum between 23 and 24 turned out to be so long, it persuaded most of the solar scientists to say that, yeah, I think 24 is going to be a small one. And that's what they, uh, their prediction is, a uh, maximum of about 90. But right now, we haven't really uh, seen that from cycle 24. But like I said before, there, there still may be some hope. And like I said before, we'll get into that in a little bit here. It's coming up. This is the other uh, prediction that gets a lot of press from the Marshall Space Flight Center. What they do is they continue to revise their prediction based on the actual results. So their prediction always looks very good. <laughs> you know, so uh, you could go to that URL down there and uh, read all about uh, their prediction. There's a lot of uh, text with uh, the MSFC prediction, so you'll learn quite a bit uh, at that website. Um, you know, there, I guess there's uh, pros and cons for uh, revising your prediction or not revising it, so we'll see what happens. Now, uh, there are more than just two predictions out there. Uh, if you go through all the technical literature, there's probably over 60 predictions for cycle 24. Uh, uh, like I said in... Uh, uh, about the uh, the ISES prediction when they carry two predictions. Uh, there were some people, there are some people predicting a low of 40. Well, we've passed that already, so that's good. Up to 180, which uh, yeah, I doubt if we're going to get there. Uh, the bluish type arrow on the left is kind of where it looks like cycle 24 is going to end up. And of course, what that says is there are going to be several people are going to be right but there are many more going to be wrong. And all that says is we just don't understand the process in the sun that causes solar cycles. So there are many different techniques to try and determine what, it, what the next solar cycle is going to look like. Uh, our quick method using the duration of solar min and the maximum sunspot cycle for the next one uh, is a precursor method. In other words, uh, the uh, a duration of solar min is a precursor to what's going to happen with the next solar cycle. And precursor methods seem to work out the best, but uh, there's still going to be a lot of guys wrong that use the precursor method using other parameters. So, okay. Uh, sunspots aren't symmetrical in the uh, uh, solar hemisphere. Uh, they emerge uh, generally 
with some preferential uh, at, at one time or another. <clears throat> so far for cycle 24, as you can see in the far right, the northern hemisphere has dominated cycle 24. In other words, most of the sunspots have appeared in the northern hemisphere of the sun. So what that leads us to believe, based on history, you know that uh, you know the the southern hemisphere one of these days hopefully is going to get going again, uh, unless the sun's going to do something really really interesting, and that's always a possibility. But just based on uh, you know one two three four five these past six solar cycles, it appears that the southern hemisphere eventually is going to get going. And remember. Uh, in that butterfly diagram, solar cycle 20, it kind of did the same thing as what maybe we're seeing. I mentioned that uh, it had a lots of asymmetry, and you can see the northern hemisphere was favored in cycle 20 for a while, for about a year or two, uh, about two years it looks like, and then the southern hemisphere finally got going and added to the total. Now, if the southern hemisphere does get going, and I think we all wish it will, uh, that could result in two peaks for cycle 24. And this is uh, the thought be from uh, Dr. I'm not sure if it's Presnell or Purnell of the Goddard Space Flight Center. He believes that cycle 24 is going to have two peaks. And of course the second peak will likely come from sunspots in the southern hemisphere if it gets going. He cites cycle 14 is uh, similar to cycle 24. Uh, cycle 14 kind of reached a peak and went down, came back up, went down, came back up. So that certainly would prolong uh, propagation on the higher bands, and hopefully, uh, hopefully that'll happen. Now this is a great NASA video. I don't know if you saw it, but uh, it kind of talks about two peaks and the the uh, solar cycle asymmetry. So uh, if you got a pen and paper handy, write that down. Uh, and go watch it. It's, uh, I don't know, it's five or six, seven, eight minutes or something like that, but it's very well done by NASA, and I, I encourage you to look at it. Okay, let's look at other two-peak cycles. Uh, what this plot looks at is just uh, cycle 19 through 23, and cycle 19, which is uh, dark blue, uh, didn't really have a second peak. I don't know, you, you might be able to call that a second peak, uh, but really it kind of didn't. Of course, when it was that high, it didn't really need to have a second peak. <laughs> uh, cycle 20, which is the uh, violet here, a reddish violet or pinkish, uh, it didn't have a second peak really. It looks kind of funny, in fact. Cycle 21 is yellow, and nothing really obvious in a second peak. But cycle 22, which is the, the light blue, uh, that definitely had a second peak. There's a nice minimum in between the, the two uh, peaks. <clears throat> and cycle 23, which was this uh, eh, kind of dark reddish color, had a very obvious uh, double peak with a nice minimum in between. <clears throat> Now I just want to remind everyone too that uh, uh, the official peak of a solar cycle is in terms of the, in terms of the smooth solar index, not the monthly means. So just uh, be aware of that, and uh, you know, look at the smooth data to determine what uh, if it, if there was a peak or not. <clears throat> now looking back through history, there there's some indication that some of the earlier cycles had two peaks. Cycle 5, it kind of had one. It was a low cycle, but it kind of uh, went down and then gradually came up again. Cycle 9 had it had two peaks. Uh, they weren't too far apart. Cycle 11 had two peaks, but unfortunately the second wasn't, you know, really didn't help that much, I guess. And cycle 12, uh, well, that's kind of nice. So it would be nice if... Uh, if uh, cycle 24 did something like cycle 23, which had a definite second peak, and cycle 12 would be a nice one to, to mimic too if, if it happens. And I think we're all <clears throat> kind of hoping it happens. Now we've talked about uh, sunspot numbers and 10.7 and centimeter solar flux, and it, it needs to be pointed out that you know these are just 
proxies for the true ionizing radiation that forms the ionosphere. The true ionizing radiation is at wavelengths from roughly uh, 0.1 to 100 nanometers. Now, 100 nanometers is about a million times shorter than 10.7 centimeters. And uh, per Planck's law, that says that uh, uh, the true ionizing radiation at 100 nanometers has about a, hundred, a, a million times as much energy as 10.7 centimeter solar flux. So we can say that uh, uh, in, in a kind of a common vernacular of the day that 10.7 centimeter solar flux couldn't ionize its way out of a paper bag. And you got to remember that. Uh, again, sunspots and 10.7 centimeter solar flux are just proxies for the true ionizing radiation. Uh, I've listed uh, the wavelengths that are uh, responsible for the DE and F2 regions. Uh, and further, uh, the important wavelength for the F2 region is around 30 nanometers. Uh, that contributes to about two-thirds of the electron density of the F2 region. So what we can do is download some uh, uh, data that shows what is happening at 26 to 34 nanometers. That's one of the uh, uh, sensors on board satellites. And if we try and correlate uh, this extreme ultraviolet to the daily sunspot number, and the daily 10.7 centimeter solar flux, what we'll see is that the uh, daily EUV is correlated a little bit better to solar flux than to the sunspot number. Okay, that's good to know, but we really shouldn't throw out sunspots because, well, the ionosphere kind of throws us a curve. If we look at the, for example, uh, what the ionosphere is doing, and I've chosen to look at the Boulder maximum usable frequency uh, in November 2001, and try and correlate the daily uh, MUF to the daily 10.7 centimeter solar flux, and I, it's like I misspelled solar, how about that? Okay, and also then correlate the MUF to the daily sunspot number, and then correlate the daily MUF to the daily EUV, we'll see that neither of those really correlate well to what the ionosphere is doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And the reason for that is simply that the, uh, the F2 region ionization uh, not only depends on solar radiation, but also depends on geomagnetic field activity and events in the lower atmosphere coupling up to the ionosphere. So, uh, you really can't say that 10.7-centimeter uh, solar flux is better than sunspots, and that's because of uh, other factors that contribute to the ionosphere, and it's something we just have to live with. Here's another interesting correlation, and what this is is the R12 is the smooth sunspot number, F12 is the smooth solar flux from 1991 through the peak of cycle 23, which was April 2000. Uh, okay, the first peak of cycle 23, April 2000. You can see that uh, uh, these two parameters were extremely well correlated. Uh, R squared is 0.995. All the data points pretty much fall on the trend line. But after that first peak, uh, something happened. Uh, this is the smooth sunspot number versus smooth solar flux uh, from 1991 through the present. In other words, uh, through the second peak of 23 and, and down a little bit, too. You can see that, uh, uh, that well, for one, and the correlation went down from 0.995 to 0.9827. And also, uh, the data points are, uh, you know, there's, there's some data points falling up here, which uh, we can summarize it by saying that we see, now see less sunspots for a given 10.7 centimeter solar flux. What that leads us to is an interesting paper by Livingston and Penn about sunspots disappearing. Now, what they've been doing since about 1995 or a little bit earlier, you can see that in a plot here, they've been measuring the, the 
uh, magnetic field strength of sunspot regions. And uh, coupled with the fact that sunspots are visible when their magnetic field strength is greater than 1500 Gauss, suggests that if things continue the way they're going, we're not going to see any sunspots towards the end of this decade. Now, the most recent data by Dr. Leif Svalgard through 2013 shows that trend is decreasing. So we're not seeing as many sunspots, and that's why that previous graph had that funny anomaly to it. Okay, well, sunspots and solar flux are, again, just proxies. What did the uh, extreme ultraviolet do? And this plot shows cycle 23 in terms of the smooth sunspot number. That's blue. There's the first peak. You can see that the second peak in terms of the smooth sunspot number was a little bit lower. Okay. And here in dark red is the 10.7 centimeter solar flux, the smooth value. Interestingly, the second peak in terms of the smooth 10.7 centimeter solar flux was higher than the first peak. Now, knowing that uh, uh, we kind of said that it looks like uh, the solar flux correlates better to the EUV, uh, this is the smooth, smooth extreme ultraviolet radiation from the sun for cycle 23. And again, the second peak in terms of EUV is higher than the first peak. Uh, so uh, just because sunspots are disappearing may not be a bad thing. Now, there's some other measurements that scientists can make on the sun to show that uh, uh, really, the sunspots are the only thing that are disappearing. This top plot is the smooth sunspot number, and it's kind of hard to see, but there's a dark black line for smoothed. Uh, the spiky data is monthly data. Uh, but in terms of the smooth sunspot number, the second peak was lower. That's why I got a red arrow going down. In terms of uh, the 10.7 centimeter solar flux, you can see that the second peak was higher. That means that's why I gave it a green arrow going up. Uh, here's a helium uh, spectral line at uh, 1083 angstroms, which is 108.3 nanometers. You can see that the second peak was higher than the first peak, uh, according to that parameter. There's also a uh, magnesium-2 spectral line, uh, okay, spectral line that we me can measure, and it's a, it showed that the second peak uh, of cycle 23 was higher than the first peak. And again, it has a green arrow going up. And this is uh, the actual critical frequencies of ionosons. This is actual ionosphere data. And it's kind of hard to see, but there's the first peak of cycle 23, and the second peak was higher. So the ionosphere really was higher in the second peak, and that's why I gave it the green arrow. Of course, that explains why 6 meters was so good around November 2001, the second peak of cycle 23. Uh, even though the sunspot number was less, that uh, really didn't have any relevance since all the other parameters showed that the second peak was higher. So this kind of suggests that the sunspots are the only parameter that is disappearing. So that brings us to uh, consider what's going to happen at uh, uh, the next grand solar minimum. Perhaps it's just uh, sunspots disappear, but the actual true ionizing radiation, uh, extreme ultraviolet, may still be there. So it very well could be that a, solar, a grand solar minimum may not be as bad as we think. Now this is kind of radical thinking because we've always tied um, like the modern minimum to, wow, there'd be no propagation at all in the higher bands. But maybe that's not true. And the only thing we can do is, uh, is kind of wait and see what happens to EUV as the sunspots disappear. Now, this plot is, is a, uh, uh, trying to show a comparison of uh, solar cycle 3, 4, and then the Dalton minimum in that yeah, it kind of looks like you know our cycle 22, our cycle 23, and perhaps our cycle 24 is looking like we're just coming into a, a minimum period. Uh, you know, I don't know if it's going to happen or not, and I'm sure no one knows. Uh, we'll just have to get all the data uh, throughout 
solar cycle 24 to see if it's like cycle 20, so like cycle 5, and then cycle 25 see it's, see if it's kind of like cycle 6. Then maybe we can uh, uh, come up with a conclusion that uh, we're we're uh, we, we're just seeing the entrance into a, uh, a grand solar minimum. Okay, uh, disturbances from the sun. I think I got a couple more slides, and that's about it. I thought I'd just uh, go over that real quick. This is a, a worldwide picture of the Earth, and what it does is depicts how disturbances, uh, solar disturbances, uh, affect the ionosphere. Uh, a good uh, tutorial to read on all this is the NOAA scales at that URL. It talks about G, which is geomagnetic storms, S, solar radiation storms, and R, radio blackouts. And as you can see, geomagnetic storms uh, cause decreased F2 region muffs at high and mid latitudes, and they can cause enhanced F2 region muffs at low latitudes. And of course, they affect us both day and night. Geomagnetic storms also cause increased auroral ionization, uh, which is good for VHF type guys. Uh, they cause increased absorption, and they can cause some horizontal refraction. Uh, in other words, uh, we're more familiar with what we call skewed paths. Uh, a solar radiation storm is uh, increased D region absorption in the polar cap, which is that area inside the auroral oval. Which of course is centered on the north magnetic or on the magnetic pole, either north or south. If we looked at the southern auroral oval, and a radio blackout is increased absorption on the daylight side of the Earth. So what that allows us to do is uh, we can do some mitigation for disturbances, and this is kind of the propagation section of this whole uh, uh, presentation. Uh, for geomagnetic storms, we can check for auroral propagation. We can check for skewed pass on 160. If you're trying to make a uh, HF path across uh, mid and high latitudes, you're probably going to have to move down in frequency. If you're uh, looking for a low latitude path, uh, a path that stays at low latitudes like the southern USA to VKZL, you might have an enhanced path. For solar radiation storms, uh, the effect is not necessarily similar in the polar caps. So, uh, if there is a so, if WWV says there's a solar radiation storm going on, uh, then what you can do is uh, try long path, short path. It very well could be one is better than the other. That's because the paths, the, the polar caps aren't affected equally. For radio blackouts, uh, the only thing you can do is try the higher frequencies because uh, as you go up in frequency, the absorption is less. And also look for paths that are in darkness. Uh, there are no guarantees here; they're just suggestions. And uh, okay, come on. Okay, I can't get to the. Okay, uh, Carl, you still with us? Looks like maybe his. Computer uh, locked up there. We'll give it a second. Yeah, Carl, I'm not uh, hearing your uh, your audio. I do see your screen, but I'm not hearing your audio. Okay, uh, just bear with us, folks, while we uh, try to get him back online here. The next page here. Okay. Hello. There, there you go. Okay, where'd you lose me? Um, okay. I don't know. You, you were trying to advance, and then uh, we kind of lost oh, okay, you. You're back now. So. Okay. Yeah, I'm back. I don't know what happened, but I think it's my computer probably. Uh-oh. Uh, hold on. Uh, am I? Uh, yeah, I think I'm working. 
Okay. Yeah, you're still there. Um, Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, there's some funny stuff going on. Uh, here are the references. Um, uh, again, like I said, uh, these will allow you to uh, uh, go into a lot of detail on the stuff I talked about. And uh, there's some more. And wait a minute. There we go. Here's a summary. Uh, we, we covered a lot of material, and, and the following are what I consider important. Uh, Cycle 24 has a good chance of having a second peak, and of course that will help prolong propagation on the higher bands. Uh, right now, the few Cycle 25 predictions are for another low solar cycle. Take advantage of the high bands now, guys and ladies. More than likely, one of these days we'll enter another grand solar minimum. Will it be in our lifetime? Who knows? Uh, uh, we don't know when or don't know how deep it's going to be. But it'll be interesting to see if uh, what happens to the ionosphere during that solar minimum period. Uh, will it go away altogether? Uh, will, it, uh, will it still be there because the true ionizing radiation is still good? Well, hopefully we'll get some data here in the next uh, decade or two. And if you're going to use a, a propagation predictions, it's probably best to use the smooth 10.7 centimeter solar flux because that's uh, right now, or at least since the peak, second peak of cycle, or for, since the first peak of cycle 23, it seems to be correlated better to the true ionizing, ionizing radiation. So that's all I had, Ken. Uh, see okay. if there are any questions. Very good. Yeah, we have a couple of questions in here. So um, for those of you, if, uh, if you'd like, you can um, go ahead and then uh, send in your questions. As I mentioned before, put your uh, call sign at the end. Also, if you have a microphone connected to your PC and you'd like to speak to Carl directly, um, we'll try that. <clears throat> and what you need to do, uh, since everyone is muted, uh, on the small rectangular grab tab, you should have a, uh, a hand. And if you click on that, that's just like you're sitting in a classroom and you're raising your hand. So if you raise your hand, I will uh, go ahead and then, uh, try to bring you online to uh, unmute uh, your microphone and bring you online so you can uh, talk to uh, Carl. So, um, okay, here we go with the questions I do have. And uh, this is one of the neat things about these uh, webinars is uh, we can have uh, people from all over the uh, world joining us. And the first one comes from... Uh, uh, Eric, uh, K9GY, probably uh, known to most of you as uh, Tango 6, Mike Oscar over in uh, Afghanistan. And uh, Carl asks uh, about the 10.7-centimeter uh, solar flux. He said, so basically it's just a, an average of an average. Is, is that the correct uh, interpretation, uh, Carl? Uh, um, uh, oh, uh, yeah, there I am. Okay. Yeah, there's something funny with my computer. Um, okay. Uh, uh, hey, hey, Eric. How you doing? Uh, good to hear you. One of these days we're gonna uh, stay up late enough to work you on twenty. But uh, th there's, you know, there's this is the daily ten point seven centimeter solar flux. Uh, that does not correlate very well with with the what the ionosphere does on a day to day basis, and that's because there, like I mentioned, there are other factors that affect uh, the ultimate amount of ionization in the ionosphere. Then, uh, if you take all those daily values, you get the uh, monthly mean, and that that's would probably work pretty good in a propagation program. But uh, propagation programs were developed to use the smooth solar, uh, smooth solar index, whether it be sunspots or solar flux. So, uh, I, I guess in a way you could say uh, that the. Uh, the best thing to do is kind of use the solar, the long-term solar flux, uh, and not certainly not the daily. You, the, the, the band can, the, the ionosphere can vary plus or minus easily plus or minus one band if you try and use a prediction with uh, the daily solar flux. So uh, just be aware of that. I'm not sure I answered your question. Maybe maybe I don't understand your question good enough, Eric. Okay, and um, he had one other question as long as we're at it here, and uh, he was wondering what causes the uh, butterfly effect on that uh, graph that you were showing earlier. Well, if well, it, it's it's the process of generating solar cycles. It's how the uh, uh, how the, uh, the the plasma flows in the sun. If we understood that, we could predict solar cycles very well. 
Well, what all it says is that uh, uh, you know sunspots emerge at high latitudes because that's how the plasma flow is inside the sun, and uh, they follow that flow towards the equator. That's about the best I can answer it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, the next question from Jim, W9, uh, Victor, November Echo. Uh, is there any correlation between the solar cycle and uh, sporadic key propagation? Yeah, hi, Jim. Um, uh, well, I, I've read quite a bit about it, and there doesn't appear to be a strong correlation between uh, the summer sporadic key and a solar cycle. So uh, that's kind of a, a short answer. There, obviously, there is something that causes some summers to be better than other summers. Uh, I'm not aware, maybe I'm not even the right guy to ask uh, VHF type questions. So uh, as far as I know, uh, summer ES will always be there to some degree, and uh, it doesn't seem to be correlated uh, very highly to a solar cycle. Okay, uh, Mike asked if you've ever run smooth sunspot numbers using uh, 13 months or 11 months, for example, and uh, any idea what that might look like? Well, uh, probably look pretty similar to the 12-month, uh, uh, the, sm the official smooth sunspot number. It's actually uh, 13 months of data, but the two extreme ends of the data just are weighted by a half. Uh, once you uh, start averaging the uh, monthly means, uh, it, it's easy to play with it with Excel <laughs> if you get all the daily data and then the monthly data and uh, plot all that stuff. But uh, there's probably not a lot of difference between 11 and 13. Okay, uh, I'm going to ask this question. I don't know that you've got an answer, Carl, but uh, maybe someone else does, and they can uh, respond. Doug, uh, VE5 Charlie and Mike Alpha is wondering if there's a uh, standard Twitter hashtag for uh, sporadic E outbreaks. <laughs> so if you don't know, maybe someone else can answer that. Yeah, I don't know, so that's okay. a question for someone else. Okay, uh, Jeff, Kate, uh, ND, uh, recent NASA Science News uh, pointed out uh, that Penn and Livingston predict an extended solar minimum starting cycle 25. Should top banders for a uh, modern uh, launder uh, take heart? <laughs> yeah, that's, you know, I, I, I basically, hi Jeff, I basically grew up with the uh, axiom that uh, the, the lower frequencies were better at solar minimum. Uh, there's sure a lot of DX to be worked on the low frequencies at solar maximum. Uh, you just got to be there, but most people are up playing on 10 meters with you know S9 plus 20 uh, signals as opposed to signals at the noise. Um, there's really, you know, we, top, you know, top banders do their DXing at night, and if you look at the ionosphere at night. Uh, at solar min and solar max, th there's not a heck of a lot of difference. So uh, from a physics basis, it, uh, it may not be as bad as we think. And, uh, you know, I, I can only cite, you know, W8JI at the peak of cycle 23 working, you know, over 200 countries and all 40 zones on 160. And I think uh, if you're there, you might be surprised on how much DX you can work at solar max. Yeah, if somebody's on the other end, too, it helps. I see. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's yeah, always that's key, isn't it? <laughs> yep. Okay, uh, two more here. Gary, W9XT. Uh, Carl, do the different UV wavelength levels track well, or do they vary with respect to each other? Hi, Gary. Uh, no, they, I think they track very pretty well. Um, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember. Uh, there's uh, uh, there's there's not a lot of uh, wavelengths uh, that that at least I've had access to. Um, there, there's a lot of data out there, and and my guess is uh, the different wavelengths in EUV probably track very well together. And uh, the reason I used uh, the the uh, uh, 26 to 34 was because it was easily available and it 
uh, it was responsible for, uh, you know, like about two-thirds of the electrons in the F2 region, so that kind of made sense. Okay, last question from Gordon, VE6 Sugar Victor. Uh, do you believe, Carl, that in the future the EUV will emerge to be the better indice to predict HF openings? Hmm. Um, right now, because of the those other two parameters, the geomagnetic field activity and events coupling up to the ionosphere, uh, you know, events in the lower atmosphere coming up, coupling up to the ionosphere. Uh, the day-to-day -day variability is uh, we we just can't predict it with with uh, EUV or even uh, ten seven or or the sunspots. Uh, I I believe that when the 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 physical models of the atmosphere and, and ionosphere get better, and perhaps someday we'll be able to present uh, or we'll be able to have a true daily model of the ionosphere that probably the EUV will be good there. But right now, since our understanding of the ionosphere is uh, more on a monthly basis, uh, it doesn't appear to me that EUV is any better than the other two. Uh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's okay. Okay. All right, well, with that, we're going to go ahead and uh, wrap it up. Uh, Carl, I want to thank you for uh, taking the time to put the uh, presentation together and uh, for uh, being here to uh, share this with us and also uh, for everyone that attended. Now, Carl, you mentioned you're going to be at Visalia this week, and I forgot to ask you, are you doing any uh, presentations there, or are you just a spectator? Well, uh, I'm going to be in the DXU, uh, DX University uh, Friday, and I'll be doing Gee whiz, a propagation one. How about that? Okay. <laughs> well, hey, I was going to go ahead and mention that, so if anyone's uh, going to Visalia, go ahead and uh, check them out. So anything else you want to add, Carl, before we uh, shut nope. us down? Not really. Just thanks for uh, sponsoring these. And uh, um, uh, I, I encourage everyone to, you know, keep, uh, you know, go to the website and see what's coming up. And uh, they're really, I've, I've enjoyed the ones I all the ones that I've visited uh, or, or participated in, and it's really, like I said, a great way to expand your knowledge. Yeah, and um, I was just going to mention, too, go to the web page and um, sign up for uh, Dean's uh, presentation on the 26th. And, of course, if you have any uh, suggestions or uh, people you think would uh, uh, be great to have on here, all you have to do is drop me an email. We're always open to uh, to uh, suggestions along that front as well. So, okay, once again, thanks everyone. Uh, glad you could be with us, and uh, hopefully we will uh, see you for the uh, next event uh, with N6BV. So, with that, everyone, take care. Thanks again.